Okay, hello. I'm Kat Sarfis, Forever Bookseller at Barnes Noble. Today we are joined by the brilliant Grady Hendrix. Grady is an award-winning novelist and screenwriter, the author of Horror Store, My Best Friend's Exorcism, We Sold Our Souls, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, uh, currently being adapted into a TV series, uh, The Final Girl Support Group, and now How to Sell a Haunted House. He has also authored the Bram Stoker award-winning nonfiction book, Paperbacks from Hell, which is somewhere. Um, and his latest nonfiction book, In These Fists Break Bricks, How Kung Fu Movies Swept America and Changed the World. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. No, thanks for having me. And I'm sorry my books have such ridiculously long titles. <laughs> Hearing them read back, I'm like, <laughs> couldn't I just call them things like virus, guilt, requital, puppet? No, I no. don't. They, they wouldn't have the same. Uh, it, 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 it would change them. And I think, honestly, I think they're perfect. Um, oh, the okay. first uh, book of yours that I read was uh, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires uh, for a book club, uh, I might add. Um, it had just come out. And then, of course, I immediately had to read everything else you had written up until that point. Uh, but it is uh, the final goal support group that holds a special place in my heart because I had just given birth to my daughter and survived I would say the horrors of pregnancy and childbirth. And I was really in this sort of like postpartum fog, hormones wild, running on no sleep. I just wanted to feel like myself for a minute. And so I looked through my never ending TBR pile for something to read and everything was a no. Um, and then like a shining light, I saw my advanced reader copy of Final Girls. And I said, yes, this, this is the one. And it was um so I just devoured it uh Lynette gave me life uh so I want to oh, thank you thank for you. that and <laughs> thank you for your stories um but also thank you for writing such like resilient women um Patricia Abby and Gretchen um Lynette Chris uh Pulaski Louise uh what is your inspiration for these characters are they based on people you know, people you wish you knew, maybe a little bit of yourself? I think people are more resilient than they get credit for uh, mm -hmm. in general. Most of those characters are based on people I know. Um, I mean, it's different versions of them. It's 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 some with more, some with less, some dialed up, some dialed up. Some are two people mashed together in mm -hmm. some kind of sick Frankenstein's experiment. But yeah, I mean, you know, and and I grew up with three older sisters. So I've always sort of uh, been around people who, you know, took, took a punch and keep, kept on trucking. I've been really lucky because I've gotten to write the characters I need to be writing. You know, uh, Chris, I'm not one of those authors who's like, ooh, my characters come to life. It's magic. They start doing their <laughs> own thing on the page. Because that just sounds really not, that's not my speed. You do spend a long time with your imaginary playmates when you write a book. And I wrote, we sold our souls during a really bad time in my life. And, uh, I, I that book was canceled at one point, like at the last minute. And um, it was this thing where I could not ditch Chris. I just couldn't do it. Um, it was kind of like she didn't quit and I was about to quit on her. And I know that sounds a little bit unhealthy, um, but I had a seven day period uh, between my publisher canceling the book and it was over the holidays and the cancellation getting announced. It was actually 10 days, but there were some weekends in there. So in the seven days, I like rewrote the whole book and and sort of saved it but it was like I just couldn't quit but if I'd been writing a different book with a different main character who wasn't Chris who didn't give up you know what I mean I, I thought that book would have been canceled but it is is it a little bit like that character at that time like then you're yeah. right yeah exactly so it's like exactly. that in that moment to your point um and that's gonna you know I feel like you know when you're saying your your playmate it, it makes me think a little bit <laughs> now I'm like my brain is shifting into into this new book you know and I, I think to myself you know, reading Final Girls and, and reading Lynette at that moment, even as a mm -hmm. reader, like she kind of gave me life. Like I was like, oh, this is the character that I need to follow now. This is the character that I needed in my life right now. Whereas I think if I had read Louise at that moment, I think maybe I would have right. had a different reaction. But reading her now, again, it, it's very different. So, well, it's also, you know, one thing I didn't think about with uh, Final Girls is I did the big rewrite on that book in the early part of 2020, right at the beginning of lockdown. And and I sort of rewrote the back third of the book. And a lot of it really came together. It was fine, but it was like, it was like a B plus. And like, I was like, this book just isn't landing. And it wasn't until after I finished, I was like, oh, I had to sort of live like Lynette behind locked doors, scared of going to the supermarket, worried about every stranger I saw on the street to kind of get that book where it needed to be. So it was like, the books come at the times they've need to come which sounds very woo woo 
So I apologize. In a way, it all it all falls into place. Who was your favorite final girl? Oh, well, that's that's easy for me. Um, so the one I had the most fun writing uh, was Heather. Heather's so much. I, it, <laughs> jerks are so much fun to write. Like, I love writing jerks. Lynette's really close because I spent the most time inside her head. There have been so many times in my life when I've, like, charged into what I thought was a corridor and it turned out to be a wall, but I was really convinced I was right uh, and I was so wrong. But the one who's my favorite is Danny. Danny is is my champ. Um, she's in a lot of ways the hero of that book. Um, she's the one who sort of loses the most ultimately mm-hmm. and kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, comes the furthest. Uh, so write everything writing with Danny in there. I was just like, you know, I've got a I've got a crush on Danny. She's she's my hero. Um, <laughs> I love but that. it was also, yeah, it was it was funny though. It was also uh, you know doing that last third rewrite, Adrian became a lot more important too, because I realized what I'd done was a really stupid thing, which was there, even though it's not as pervasive as people think it is, there is a trope in horror movies where the black character dies first Mm -hmm. and Adrian's death kicks off the book. It's not a spoiler. It's the first chapter. Um, And I was like, oh crap, like I've done the same thing I hate. And so I really spent a lot of time trying to make her still feel like a living presence in the book and trying to have her interact with the characters more. And there's a version of the book, if you kind of squint and look at it sideways, where it's a book about Adrian saving Lynette's life mm-hmm. um, and, and Adrian getting Lynette to sort of step into her shoes and to sort of get out of her own misery and, and actually save other people. Um, so that's where it was in my head. Although anyone who comes up to me and says, you're a jerk, the black character dies first. I can't argue. No, I suppose so. But like you said, the, the, how it ends, how it wraps, you know, you try to, you know, take those things into perspective and it is true. I mean, speaking of tropes, there's, there are a lot of horror tropes, but they're like, there are tropes in any, in any genre, genre, uh, you know, romance, fantasy. Um, so speaking of tropes, how to sell a haunted house definitely had a, like a different vibe to it. I definitely went on a roller coaster of emotions with this one. Oh, good. Um, I laughed. I retched, literally. Uh, I hurried, I definitely hurried through passages that made me squirm and sort of lingered on oh, passages good. that warmed me. I had a few really good cathartic cries at the end. Um, and then I kind of just like felt complete when it ended. Um, but this book felt really personal um, to me. So I have to ask what brought you to the story? Basically, um, I had to write this book and it was really and and there was sort of two things that were going on. Um, the big one was I wrote this all during the pandemic and sort of you spend a long time with the book and I really miss my family. And I was like, you know, and I've been wanting to write a book with a family in it. And families are hard. Everything in a family's backstory. So it's really hard to write a family in the present because you know, I, I'm sure you've gone to like your partner's family's house like early on in the relationship and had dinner and you've left and been like, well, that was that was nice. And they're like, oh, are you kidding? Can you believe yeah. what like Ken did? <laughs> and my mom, did you hear it? She was and you're like, I right over my head because, you know, you don't know the family language. But so I wanted to spend time with the family. And so and, and fam and horror haunted house books are always about families. Um, the Shining's about a family. The Amityville Horror is about a family. Um, the Haunting of Hill House is about a lack of family. You know, I mean, they're always, uh, Tony Morrison's Beloved is about a family, you know. So it was a haunted house book. But there were also sort of two other things that happened. And one is that, you know, my mom had a couple of health scares during the pandemic. And at one point I was standing in her garage and I was looking around and thinking, if she dies, what am I going to do with all this crap? Like, it's a lot of crap. You know, there's stuff that's easy, like opening pictures and, you know, family heirlooms. That's the good, get out of here, you amateur. What about like, you know, your mom's glasses? You know, you, you're really going to hold on to your mom's readers for the rest of your life? Like, but throwing yeah. them away, she wore them for years. You, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's like stuff. And ghost stories are about stuff that gets left behind and dealing with them. Ghosts, memories, curses, or crap, glasses. And then also, um, I think all of us have really interesting and kind of unexamined relationships with inanimate objects. If you've got a car, you've got a relationship with that car that's that's emotional and fraught. Um, Our laptops, uh, our phones. Have you ever stepped, because this has happened to me, you step on a kid's stuffed animal and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. Like you apologize to it real quick. Always, always. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like it's inanimate, it doesn't care, but does it not really maybe kind of it does i don't know not gonna take the chance it's like you don't walk under a ladder like what if 
Exactly. There, no, there are definitely superstitions. And I think I will say the movie Toy Story definitely ruined everything for me. Um, oh, yeah. Just in terms of the, in terms of toys and inanimate objects. It is funny. I, I have, you know, I go to my mom's house and I, I think once you're, you reach that adulthood and, you know, you kind of come to terms with, you know, nobody even wants to think about death. You know, nobody wants to, right. but, but it's there. And I think the, it's, you know, you have to kind of come to terms with it. And it is true when you said that, you know, those thoughts, I feel like every time I go to my mother's house and I look at all her Chotskys and like her Franklin mitt birds and I'm just, I, you don't know, <laughs> you're at a loss. Yeah. You're like, I'm not taking these. Like, I'm not. Well, like, yeah. but like, But what happens to them? And she loved them so much and I do not. And it's, you know, and I think about that, you know, my, my son has like an ever growing stuffy collection. And like, you know, and at this point they're like taking over his room and there is a point where you know, when I'm putting them, I think when I'm like putting them back, you know, organizing, cleaning up, it's like gently putting everyone in their place. Yeah. Like, You're good. You're good here. You like this place yeah. over here? <laughs> like, talking oh, exactly. To them. Like, what do they do all day? Are they bored? Do they need more stimulation? Like, should you leave the remotes out for them? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. You're yeah. responsible for them. It's a spiral. Once you go, once you yeah. start having these thoughts and going down. Yeah. Well, also, and, and not to sidebar, but like also, like everyone I talk to is like, oh, dolls and puppets, that's so creepy, blah, blah, blah. And they get all superior about it. And I'm like, and, and they act as if dolls are something that's in their grandmother's house. And I'm like, how many Funkos do you have in your cubicle? You know what I mean? How many collectible action figures? Do you have a little baby Yoda stuffed doll? Like I've got friends with it. Like we surround ourselves with little replicas of us. It's weird. It's not, is it healthy? I don't know. I don't know, but it's true. Like, and even those, like you said, inanimate objects, whether it's a doll that somehow represents a part of you that you are, you know, you can't tell everyone your life story, like you were saying before, you know, yeah. families and, and how, you know, you go to someone's house and, and you hear something and they hear something else because they've had past traumas or they've had past memories. But, you know, we do have these little things that we sort of put out there and it's like, okay, I'm not going to tell you my whole life story, but this little pump, you know, this little doll or this little, you know, Funko Pop or whatever is a little piece of me. It, it explains who I yeah. am. It explains what I like, what I love. Um, so yeah, when you think about that, like, yeah, we all have collectively have a lot of stuff that we yeah. <laughs> don't know. It's weird. And you know, it's funny, like, like I, I, I was really, really like stony broke for a while. And um, when I started writing and when you <laughs> don't have any money, you spend so much time fantasizing about the stuff you want to buy and like the first time I got like a paycheck that was like you know one where I had some extra I was like oh my god I bought like this thing and that thing I mean nothing major like some books I really want to you know blueberries and like I would say cut to eight months later I'm like I want to buy anything like I don't want stuff like that thing that felt like this gnawing hunger to have possessions yeah was gone you know what I mean like if you can have them yeah you don't really want them but if you can't have them it becomes really powerful, really yeah, powerful. That's, that's all you want. So you have a note, which I loved. Um, you wrote a note to your readers um, in the mm. beginning in the beginning of the book. And you wrote, um, millions of us walk around every day with our hearts full of ghosts and every house eventually becomes haunted. Um, so again, we kind of we touched about this, but yeah, what is it about the house, um, a home yeah. that gets us like, Every time. Why are we so, why are we collectively drawn to these haunted house stories? I mean, I will say like anytime you see it, I mean, you know, we, we have the stories, the fictional stories, but anytime you even, I sniff a hint of it, like in a news article or someone t says something, it's like, I can't, I can't look away. Like I have to, yeah. I have to sort of, I'm from Long Island. Um, and so the Amityville horror, that, that, ha yeah. that house, that has been like, <laughs> that has been over me my whole life. That story, like every. Did you live that. near it, or no? But okay. um, but it's still like it was still something that you know if I knew I was even going to be in the area or, or driving yeah. by it, it's like you just immediately click into it. Like, oh, are we are we going to be driving by the house, and then the person would be like, no, we're not, we're nowhere near it. And, you and know, I like there's they, like, the big they place. changed the they changed the facade, didn't they? At some point to get rid of those iconic windows, windows. or did they leave? They, yeah, I can't. I imagine they would have. Um, but yeah. we're just drawn to it. What, like, yeah. I don't know. And it, it, maybe it is like, to your point, family. Well, family, but also houses. Like what has become the shorthand for the worst possible thing that can happen to you? Being homeless, you know, mm -hmm. like you yeah. are unhoused. And listen, being homeless is, is not a good thing, but I'm just saying it's become such a shorthand. I mean, when we were growing up, um, I grew up in, in South Carolina 
my my family were a bunch of poor mouthers. My fam, my parents, like like my dad was a doctor. We weren't. We were solidly middle upper middle class. But like I thought we didn't have any money because of the way my parents talked. And so like I would only order water at restaurants because I thought we couldn't afford fancy things like iced tea. But there's something about a house and it's your security and it's it means so much. I mean, look at the the housing market bubble in 2008. Like all these people were buying houses um, because they got sold this dream that you and and it's a really okay. palpable dream. You can taste it. I own my home. Like that is I'm I'm no one can erase me. I've got my place. Yeah. Um, and of course, and then you <laughs> then the small print pops up and you're like, oh crap. So yeah, it's just a home is such a powerful thing, and houses are little ecosystems. I mean, Downton Abbey is something with that wrought large, right? The house yeah. is this living society with with strata of class class in it and it's this locus for weddings and funerals and events and drama um and so houses are just really really powerful and one thing that really blows my mind and i'm gonna say these numbers and they sound ridiculous but i don't want to check my notes and i'm pretty sure they're true (laughs) between 2008 and i think think it was 2012 or somewhere in there might have been 2016 there were something like 50 haunted house reality shows that popped up you know it's just in that phase of this housing insecurity this boom we were all watching these shows about haunted houses being investigated i mean look how much we all were into hoarders um you know it's the house is really really just so important to us it's where you live it's your address like you know there's three important things in your life your well four maybe your name your birth date (laughs) Your like social security number and your home address. I worked for a really long time or, or volunteers for a really long time at a, at a soup kitchen in New York. And you know your regulars and stuff. And like occasionally you get involved with trying to help people. And, and one of the hardest things is getting them an address, getting them a piece mm-hmm. of ID with an address on it. You know, you can't function without that. You know, I go to a lot of libraries and you see libraries in smaller places that just have mm-hmm. or even some smaller places have great library systems it all depends on how everyone funds their library system so you see places where the funding isn't quite working you see places where the funding's really robust libraries do so much more than checking out books and one of the big things is they're like a center for people without a fixed address to like rest to go somewhere where they won't be bugged or told to move along or rained on or anything and that's so important um when I was in, in uh, back when I was in college, I lived in my car for a little while. And like libraries were a big, big sanctuary for me. Like they were a really uh, safe place, you know. Um, and But they give you that space, that home, that fixed address briefly. I got my master's degree in library and information sciences. And I had all these, that was my dream. I was going to be a librarian. Um, I, I wanted it all. I wanted to be a children's librarian. I wanted like tissues up my sleeves and cardigans. Like I had this whole oh, yeah. like, vision. I was like, this is, this is, and then, you know, things, things take you in a different direction. And I do remember one of my professors saying, it's great degree, you know, you're going to learn a lot, but like 90% of you are not going to work in libraries just because to your point, how they're funded, you know, where they are, it's a struggle, you know, so you're not always, you know, they're not necessarily easy, easy jobs. But one of the things I did love was that sense of community and what a library does and that they're there to support their demographics, they're there to support their community. And it's so much more, um, and to what you're saying about, you know, having an address and having a home, it, it ends up it ends up being part of your identity. And I think especially, yeah. I mean, I think about, I'm, I'm sure this is is true in, in a lot of places, but I think in New York and, and, and specifically, um, you know, when you're talking to other New Yorkers, you ask like what neighborhood you're from. And exactly. that immediately like paints paint a picture of you. So yeah. it, it's part of your identity, you know, like, oh, I yeah. live in X. And immediately you're like, oh, so you're a... A, you know, and you're like, yeah, yeah. kind of like make this profile of like, oh, okay, so you live here and that that's part of your personality. And when you don't have that, it's, it's, it's like, you're not a person, you know, and so, or that it's totally. like that, that chunk is missing. So it's so, that is it is really interesting. Well, and also one of the things with the home is sometimes you don't do anything. Yeah. And it's like, if you don't have that house not to do anything in, where are you not doing anything? Like, like it's really hard to <laughs> occupy your day if you don't have a place to go. You know, like, yes. like, you know, it's like, what are you doing? You're not, you know, oh, I'm going to clean. I'm going to sort out my closet. What are you doing on Sunday? <laughs> oh, man, my kitchen's a wreck. You know, like, but if you don't have those things, time becomes really dangerous. You know, it becomes this like wild animal that will chew you up. Uh, I think we need to get to but, the puppets, the puppets. 
Oh. We need to talk about. <laughs> is that wise? Is it wise? I, I know it's probably not, but the puppets and the creepy dolls. I feel like we need to talk about the puppets. Um, I think I like it's like in a therapeutic way need to talk about the puppets. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's like this is visceral response. Um, well, now whenever I see one, so you've done a bit of research on the topic um, around as as you do, I think in all your books, which I think is is something that's uh, really wonderful. I feel like you kind of completely. When you were doing this research, as I know you do, um, what was the wildest thing when you were mm. uh, when you were researching puppets, the history of puppets and, and and dolls? Not to be diminishing, but like puppets are just like mega dolls. Like they're just like dolls writ large. And the thing about dolls is they are the one inanimate object that can make eye contact. Like, you know, nothing else does. Books, sofas, like it, it just dolls and puppets, I guess. One of the things that I thought was really, really fascinating looking at the history of puppets is just how violent and disruptive they can be. And I'm talking specifically about hand puppets. Like marionettes are like kind of fussy and like, you know, blah, blah, blah. They prance around and all that. But hand puppets are freaking wild. They're like brutes. They have an energy to them that really like takes over like Punch and Judy. Punch mm. started out as a marionette. And wound up when and really manifested in like his major form when he became a, a hand puppet. And he's incredibly violent. You know, the whole Punch and Judy show is about Punch killing people, his wife, his baby, the police, Satan. But there used to be in like 17th century England, 16th century England, like ordinances banning puppets um, from certain towns. They would sometimes meet a puppet company on the road and pay them to like pass by the town. Because where they came, you saw an uptick in uh, theft and pickpocketing, in, in sexual, inappropriate sexual behavior, in theft. But the wildest thing to me is puppets are um, independent animals. And if you don't believe that, um, you really just put a sock on your hand and draw some eyes on it and move it around and be like, am I moving it? Is it moving? Like you, you start to be a little confused about the will to move it is coming from. What happens is you feel like you've split in two almost. There's a part of your brain moving the puppet, and then you're moving you, and you're taught. It's, it's very weird, and it's legally recognized. So one of the places where puppets started in theater was in, in medieval Tudor uh, passion plays. Um, they would do Bible stories, stuff like that. And a lot of them got outlawed because the churches were like, what are you doing? You, you're a bunch of horrible actors. You can't pretend to be these biblical figures like Adam and Eve and all these. The theater companies are like, oh, we'll do them with puppets. We'll do puppet passion plays because then it's not a person. It's a puppet. Well, I mean, spoiler alert, it's still a person. This, this is just a, a piece of rag on the end of my hand. It's not an independent. It's not real. It's me. It's still an actor. But the authorities were like, oh, fine. That makes sense. As long as a puppet's doing it, a person isn't doing it. So you can do the passion plays. And it's like, what? That makes zero sense. <laughs> but it's like somehow puppets are considered, we even by law regard them as independent entities. It's weird. That's wild. And I think, and that was something when uh, Mark was sort of reliving in the book and he's reliving, so, uh, spoiler, not so, not so spoiler. Uh, Mark is sort of reliving his, you know, college experience and, he, and he's talking to Louise and he's, you know, about wh why he is the way he is and how these puppets have ruined him. And one of uh, the people in the, this sort of renegade puppet troupe is like, you know, puppets, they possess the possessor, but the, the puppet is possessing them. And, and it's, and oh, yeah. it, it, um, puppets are a possession that possesses the possessor. Yeah, yes. I was and real even, proud of that line. That is a good line. I will say I got a little chill up, uh, up my spine when I read that because it was like, oh. Yeah, that that's about right. You said yeah, even in in the in, you know in in those passages you were you did talk about and I thought that was so fascinating about the you know how towns would block and say like no we don't even want yeah. you coming here and I just that again you know you go down like a Wikipedia uh, spiral you're like what like what is this and then just sort of the history of violence. And puppets. I think sometimes we think of puppets as, you know, again, like the, like a child. Oh, it's, you know, it's, we use it to explain our feelings and, and we go to puppet shows and then, you know, even like go, getting into marionettes and how they, they're different. And then, you know, yeah. these life-size puppets and all this stuff. And so I was in a radical puppet collective for a long, for a while um, in university. That's largely based on my own experience, uh, minus a few things. One of the things that's, I think, really interesting is puppets are 
amazing. And and we only consider them for children now because largely, you know, they were they were rendered juvenile uh, mm-hmm. when like Germany and, and Russia were sort of purging their folk culture of, of anarchic impulses. And so they were taking all these characters who were like Punch and dumbing them down for kids. They were taking mm-hmm. out their sort of like, they went from killing policemen to the policeman's your friend kind of thing. Google Tony Sarge, S-A-R-G. Because there was a huge revival in puppetry in America in the 20s and 30s. Tony Sarge was one of them. He was designing puppets that fit in the Macy's Day Parade. So they were made of inflatable parts, but they required like 50 puppeteers to operate. He was building like giant 25 and 30 foot clowns for Broadway for shows uh, on there. I mean, Tony Sarge was building these large scale, technically complicated really uncanny looking puppets, like really gorgeous. It's one of those things that you can do so much with. And all you need is some sticks and some cloth and that's it. You know, I mean, didn't they do that King Kong on Broadway that flopped so bad, but it was like that massive expensive (laughs) puppet of King Kong. And I'm like, I've seen puppets that can make you cry that are just some pieces of cloth and some googly eyes. Why are you doing all this? You're making a special effect. You're not making a puppet. I'm a big, big puppetry fan. And it's weird how many people are. Like um, Danny McBride, his mom had a like Christian puppet ministry. Jordan Peele was like a puppetry major, I think, or something in, in college. Like there are all these. And when this book went out to sort of like go around in L.A., People started coming out. Oh, yeah, I was a big puppeteer. And, it's, you know, it's very hush. It all comes out. Tell, it's all, <laughs> yeah, don't it's tell a, anyone. Well, I'm, and I'm glad this book has sort of brought brought everyone together in, in, in their in their radical puppetry. My first experience with puppets were kind of weird because it was all it was like Jim Henson, but not like Jim Henson, like Muppet. It was for me, it was like Labyrinth and the Dark Crystal and, and oh, yeah. those types and those types of puppets. And, um, and yeah, I guess I didn't think of them as. As creepy. I'm not quite sure when the creep factor came in because at that point it yeah. was it were magical. Exactly. And it's also, you know, I mean, people who love fraggles and all this the never-ending story. I mean, all yeah. these things that use these big animatronics, these big puppets, like there's something about inanimate objects that really cuts past a lot of our defenses. I've seen puppet shows that would have been embarrassing for human beings to doing to be doing that. Mm-hmm. But like this little bit of shmada sh- rag with like some sticks on it becomes incredibly moving. So I'm going to be super pretentious right now. There's a short story, a really short story by um, Kafka um, called The Cares of a Family Man. And it's this dude who's like, oh yeah, I live in my house and we moved in, the kids. But he's like, there's this little dude who lives here named Odorak. And he's just like a couple of spindles and some sticks. And he rolls around the house and he was here when we got here. And he's like, you know, and he tries to talk to Odorak and Odorak's like, no. You know, he's like, where are you from, Odorak? He's like, no fixed abode. And um, he rolls off. And he's like, you know, he doesn't really hurt anyone. Like, we're, we're not going to get rid of him. Like, he was here before us. He's like, but it really bugs me that we'll be dead and he'll still be here. Puppets are alive, but they're not alive. Dolls are alive, but they're not alive. It's in that uncanny valley. So you have this love for puppets and then and so, and then you created you created pumpkin. I have to confess it's a so pumpkin is based on a real little dude. Um he's very excited he's getting famous from this uh somehow people know who he is. It's been very exciting. That's very on brand yeah, pumpkin. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um he's a stuffed animal, he's not a puppet but he very mm-hmm. could be a puppet. Yeah. Um but his real name is Snokio and he's my wife's um, childhood. She he kind of appeared in her bed when she was like two or three, and no one's quite sure where Snokio comes from. Uh, but but Snokio is real. And and the first time I remember meeting him, I was like, I'm I'm in this or I'm gonna run. Like this is um, he's really unnerving. And um, and, and we're friends now. But like he he it took a That's lot good. of getting used to. Yeah. <laughs> Going into this, I. I definitely, you know, you you think you're getting into a haunted story, and then and then yeah, not not too far in, you you right. meet, you meet the and you're kind of like, where is this going? Where yeah. is this well, going? And, also, and and also, you know, you mentioned it earlier, so I'm just going to bring it up. Toy Story, because you know, there's a version. Like, listen, I love those movies. Cry my eyes out, blah blah blah. But why are these these toys so happy all the time? Like, why are they so excited? They got left behind. Yeah. They've been abandoned, like, and and they go through lots of jumps through hoops of logic to sort of make that okay. But like, why are these toys cool with being abandoned? You know, like, why aren't they pissed? 
Like, why aren't they like hunting Andy down? Yeah. Like, you know, they know where his college is. <laughs> They're capable of traveling long distances. Why isn't Andy getting calls in the middle of the night? You know, we're coming, Andy. Like, you, we miss you, Andy. We're going to sure. stay with you forever, Andy. I'm sure there's some fan fiction out there. Some, some horror fan fiction. I don't want to Google it. <laughs> I don't want to Google it either. Um, but if there's not, now, now there's going to be. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. Because it's like in all the, it, they, they do, they're traveling, they're on adventures. It's like, uh, and it, it was just interesting with Pupkin. Like it felt justified, this anger yeah. that he had. Well, Toy Story movies are very careful to limit those toys' emotions to ones that are convenient for us. Mm-hmm. And like the, the more inconvenient ones, they don't get to have. And it's like, let them, let them have a full emotional palette, you know? I mean, or maybe not, but it, it, oh, yeah. it is, <laughs> maybe that's not the right way, but it, it is, you kind of, I mean, you're creeped out, but at the same time, you're, it's understandable. I love a good epic. Uh, I love a good three, I love like three hour long movies. I love binge watching like really good television. Um, and I feel like your books to me, and this is how I kind of describe them a lot. They they feel like I'm binge watching some like crazy new show and I don't want it to end, but I also really need to know how it ends. Um, and all I want oh, to good. do is talk about like my, you know, in my mind, my genius theories of, of what's happening. Um, they're cinematic, they're propulsive, uh, but you're also uh, a screenwriter. So to me, that makes sense. Um, so what's the biggest difference? Uh, between writing novels and writing for the screen? Writing screenplays, uh, everything's external. Um, Writing a book, everything's internal. You're always Mm -hmm. basically in someone's head, even if it's the writer's head. I'm just wrapping up the Horror Store screenplay, sort of the last draft. Horror Store is the first novel I wrote about a haunted Ikea. There's, There's two things you cannot show in a screenplay. One is someone thinking. What does that look like? You can show... A lot of things. Someone thinking is just stupid. It's a waste of the page. Someone making up their mind or changing their mind. Like you can show what they do, but that moment you can't do. And so horror store, the two big moments are the main character reflecting on their crappy life that got them to where they are and the main character changing their mind about something. And it has required so many drafts and so many, just those two things changing has like resulted in like like 20 something drafts. And we got it to a good place, but it just radically changes the story. And it's funny. I'm so glad I do the screenwriting I do because I realized how much reader's time I was wasting. Like, no one's reading me to, like, roll around and wallow in my language. So those scenes you see in a lot of books where people are thinking about things or driving somewhere thinking about things, like, what, what, what are those doing for anyone? Like, can't you do this better? And you'll see, like, in Horror Store, I've got Amy, the main character, sitting in her car by herself, driving, like doing all this. Stuff. And like now, if I've got people in a car, it's at least two people. Or, or if it's one person, something's happening. They, they don't want to be where they're going or they really need to get where they're going. Something's going on because it's just I, I feel like I was really lazy about like the page, like what's on the page, like what people, what the readers spending their time doing. So I, I tried to get better with that I can feel that like when I read because it is your books I feel you know I I definitely feel like if you're there's sometimes when you're in a reading rut or like you're just you know you're picking everything up and it is sometimes you just you just need action like you just need (laughs) like you just want things to happen and like you don't want to the exposition is just killing you and you're just kind of like I just want to you know and so that has always been something and I think that you know going back to my my earlier story about like my that postpartum experience and I was just like I can't I can't do any, yeah. I can't do any of these like I'm looking but also it was like emotional I was like oh not you know like too heavy this yeah that. and then I was like I knew I as I like you know final goals and I you know I had remembered reading uh, reading you before and I was just like okay this is gonna this is just gonna move me through and it was true I think I devoured it in like two days and I, funny I actually have a picture of me like my daughter is literally like 10 days old and she's like sleeping in her little leg like, I don't know what you want to talk about, the little snooze or whatever, you know, like right, like yeah. right next to me. And I'm I'm reading like like literally people getting like hacked up and and just, <laughs> I'm like it's like she's so it's delicate and, and, and innocent. And I'm just like, mm. just to jump onto something you're saying there. Um, so one of the things that's really hard is I'm writing my next book right now. Um, and it's 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 got a lot of pregnant ladies in it. And what? one of the things that's because who who better to write about pregnant women than a childless middle aged man? Like most middle aged men, I have a lot of unearned confidence. I got this. One of the things that's really hard is I feel like with pregnancy, and especially this is set back in the seventies in a home for unwed mothers. 
everyone's waiting. They're waiting for these Mm -hmm. babies to be born. And, you know, before there was so much imaging, it was a very almost not passive. I don't want to say it's passive, but on the surface, it appeals, appears passive. You're waiting for your baby and you're not seeing the development the way people do now. And it's been really, really hard because you can't mess with that time frame. It's nine months. Like, you know what I mean? You can't like, it's a half, it's nine months unless you really focus. And then you can do it in like two weeks, like it's yeah. nine months. And if you're in a home for unwed mothers, there's, there was never a lot to do. And so I'm finding it really, really challenging. And it's really hard and hard to sort of deal with that. And it's been hard because I think pregnancy in books often gets represented as either a really passive process, um, something that happens to you. Or as um, a horror show, like, oh, this baby sucking my life. And like, uh, and I'm, I don't know. I'm not, I, I feel like there's a wider range of experiences there, but it's really hard to sort of like, to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Going, going the horror show road is so easy and I'm trying to avoid it. It's a background or it's like Rosemary's baby. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> those are your options. That was actually like kind of leading into my next question. Um, so we've had a uh, haunted, I was going to say Scandinavian furniture superstore, really you know, haunted. I'll just yeah. say haunted Ikea. Um, we've had a, a furious power ballad journey into the heart of a conspiracy crazed country. We've had teenage exorcisms, vampires, final girls, and now killer puppets. So I was going to ask you what, um, what we were going to encounter next. And now you're, and, and, and you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been weird. This book has just been really it was, it's been so much research to start writing. Like I spent almost like 10 months interviewing OBs and, and expecting moms and people who have kids and uh, just, you know, for pregnancy, but also just like, it is wild to me that how we treat unwed mothers and mm-hmm. how we've treated them for, for decades, it's been really harrowing. One of the weird things is sometimes when you're writing a book, things sort of like line up, like, when I when I was writing These Fists Break Bricks with Chris Bajali, who's my co-writer on it, um, it's it's about Kung Fu movies coming to America. And that was 1973. And it's a it's a story about a lot of sort of black history and Latin history and and uh, Asian American history. And we were writing, like doing the bulk of the writing during the George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter protests. And so it was a really weird thing for us to be like, oh, this is going on around us now. And we're seeing that still happening in the 70s. And, you know, these people literally fighting for respect and their rights and things. One of the things been interesting doing the, the Home From and Mother's book is it's happened with, with the Dobbs decision and, and Roe mm-hmm. versus Wade being overturned and all that. And, you know, I was writing the book for months before that, but like for that at the same time, and you read about these, these homes from when mothers, they had to exist because these young and I, I call them girls because they were always referred to as girls and mm-hmm. even though people feel like that's diminishing because they are young women at the same time a lot, they were 13 years old 12 years old 14 years old you know i have two aunts who were both sent away uh when they were teenagers and they couldn't stay home because it would have ruined their lives you know what i mean it would have ruined their lives if the neighbors found out they were pregnant and and not married but at the same time the homes weren't the solution either and so in writing the book, it's been a really hard thing because you don't want to say adoption's terrible. You don't want to say all these things are terrible. And the only thing you can get down to is these girls never should have been in this position in the first place. They never should have had to be 14 years old and making a decision on whether they give up their baby or not. And, and I even regret saying that because is is one of the uh, a woman who's, who's interviewed in the, by another author who wrote a book about these said, we didn't give up our children. They were taken from us. We shouldn't have a world that put a 13-year-old in that position. Um, so it's just, so I, I don't mean to get all heavy or anything, but it's been a really weird book to write, especially right now. No, it, it's, it's, it's relevant. And it is, you know, you hear these, these stories and I think it's important to know that history because a lot of people don't, I don't think they understand that or they don't know it or they don't realize yeah. it. And I mean, if you think about it, it's not not necessarily to the fault of their own because we the whole point of those of those these homes was because it was a hush hush. You know, we yeah. don't talk about it. So that was like it's like you might not know about it because that was the whole point was that exactly. they didn't want anyone to know about it. And yeah. you know, you know, and you it, it's just that in itself is I mean, a for, horror. <laughs> it's so <laughs> you know, I know. Like, and it's like it's like for decades there was a there were a quarter of a million unwed mothers in this country year after a quarter of a million. And, you know, and there's a 
there's a woman, she was a head of children's services, but she was there in the in the 30s and the 40s. I think she retired in the early 50, late 50s. Um, and a lot of these young girls would write to the president or they'd write to the government and say, I don't know what to do. I, I, I can't tell my, I, I don't know what to do. And she would get every single letter. Everyone in Washington, D.C. for 30 years knew to forward those letters to her. And she responded to every single one. And she would direct them to the offices that could help them. She would direct them to children's services offices. She would give them personal recommendations to people she knew if she knew at the offices. But the thing that kills me is every single letter she wrote back started by saying, dear, whatever their first name was, I am so glad you wrote me. And when I think about the fact that that was probably the only adult who was saying anything nice to these girls at that moment in their life. It's heartbreaking. I mean, yeah. this woman needs a statue to her, you know, like, like you know, just doing this unsung, unrewarded, unrecognized work. It probably saved thousands of lives. There are, there are a lot of hidden, uh, I hate to, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, but there's yeah. a lot of hidden angels in, in a way, you know yeah. what I mean? In our, you know, that, that don't get spoken of, obviously, uh, as a mother, but also just as a fan, very much looking no. forward. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard. I, I just to... don't want to screw it up. I don't want to uh, screw it up, you know? All right, so we'll, we'll bring it home. We'll lighten it up a bit, or may, maybe not, I don't know, depending, depending on how you answer. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 let me, let me, let me steer this right off the Um, Because I, <laughs> I always love, uh, I'm always looking for good book recommendations. So I always love to ask uh, brilliant writers such as yourself what you're reading now, um, or what you're reading now, or what was the last uh, great book that you read that just kind of like, Exploded. Okay. Do you know the essay writer, Thomas Lynch? He's like the poet who's yes. the mortician. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I really like Thomas Lynch. I find some of his personal politics, not my personal politics. He leaves me a little cold with that. But I think he's a beautiful writer about death and dying. So there's a book that's out of print that's the birth version of Thomas Lynch. It's called A Midwife's Story. And I can only see the spine right now. Um, <laughs> but it's Armstrong and Feldman. Hold on. I'm going to pull this out because I want to give you the author's names. It's uh, Penny Armstrong and Sherilyn Feldman, but it's a memoir and a series of essays written by a woman who is a midwife in uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she worked with the writer to put it together. And it is absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. I mean, what mm -hmm. Thomas Lynch does for death, she really does for birth. Um, and sort of like encompassing all the different aspects of it, the bad ones, the hard ones, the good ones, the easy ones, and really talking about it in, in life and where that fits mm -hmm. in your life. Um, the most recent book I've read that like really was my one I just finished this morning called Revenge of the Dolls, uh, which is an out of print. It's a children's book by Carol Beach York, which is not much happens. There's just some dolls in a house and a couple of little kids, but it is so alarmingly well-written. I've read a bunch of juvenile fiction from the seventies that just like blah, blah, blah. This is alarmingly good. So one of the places I always tell people to go is Valancourt, which is um, a small press. They do, yep. uh, they bring stuff back in this out of print. They've got a bunch of uh, Christmas ghost story books they put out that are anthologies of ghost stories that were published at Christmas. Most of them are 19th century, early 20th that are great. But they also wrote a book, uh, put out a book by Elizabeth Armstrong that's sort of republished. It came out in the 80s called When Darkness Loves Us. It's two novellas and they're both really good. But the first one in there is one of the most disturbing books about motherhood I've ever read in my life. Um, it's a, a young, newlywed uh, woman, and she's on her husband's farm, and she accidentally gets locked in an unused basement and thinks that she can get out because she finds a passage, and it just goes deeper and deeper. And oh, by the way, she's pregnant. Um, <laughs> it's so disturbing. Um, so yeah, and if people are looking for a ghost story for Christmas, uh, Michael McDowell's The Elementals takes place in the heat of the summer, um, but it's so good, and it's such a great ghost story. He's most famous for writing the screenplays for Nightmare Before Christmas and uh, Beetlejuice. That's amazing. I, I mean, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna plug your, I know I mentioned it earlier in the introduction, but I gotta plug your paperbacks from hell. Um, oh, thank you. I love it. I love, I mean, like, I think just for the covers alone. Like, I kind of feel like I, I would so want to. good. I just want the art. Like, I just want it, like, hanging on my There's wall. a, um, it's not an original, but that's a Lisa Falkenstern back there for I, Tom Montana's Night I Train. Want, I was going to comment on it at some point. Oh, I was yeah. staring at it for those of you who are watching. But yeah, there's just, uh, just all of them. It's just the, the camp and the, the gore and the just, it's just amazing. And these covers, I almost, I'm, I'm jealous of people just walking into libraries and bookstores in that time and just being able to pick up these insane paperbacks. Yeah. 
Um, well, and people are bringing them back into print. I mean, Ken Greenhall's Child Grave just came back into print. It's such a beautiful winter story um, and disturbing, but really good. Yeah, no, and I know you you po- like you were like posting covers and you had a lot of like Christopher Pike and it like it was like blast from the past. Like I kind of was like, oh my gosh! Like you remember reading these and I was a big into him and like R.L. Stein, of course, and the fear, but like yeah. Fear Street, not even just like the, the goosebumps. I would try to get people to remember. I'm like, he did these like, you know, these kind of crazy horror books. The teenage, or they were so weird. Stein stuff is so weird. weird. Yeah. Pike is, I, I prefer Pike. Stein, yeah. I love that he's still writing. He still does his thing. He He's he's great. But I didn't, I was too old to read Pike when I was a teenager and reading him as an adult, you're like, this man is deranged, but beautifully <laughs> deranged. Like, <laughs> just Pike stuff blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It, uh, I always tell people in my nineties, this is a weird, wild time. My wild times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be a kid, yeah. it was a wild. It was a wild time. Um, Grady, thank you again. Thank you for the thrills, yeah. the gore, the mayhem. Uh, this has been wonderful. How to sell a haunted house? My beat up copy right here is out now. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of How to Sell a Haunted House. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. (laughs) I am coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Leewood, Kansas. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're all very excited for a new Grady Hendrix, all the time, always. Such a big fun read any book that gets released by Grady Hendrix is a great ride. So um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in if you are cool with that, Jamie. I've got a pretty fun one to recommend. Great. Um, so I chose a book that came across my radar very randomly, but I have been hand-selling it for years now, and it is The Grip of It by Jack Gems. It basically takes the trope of couple moves into haunted house, spooky things happen, are they going crazy? Is the house haunted? What's going on? You've heard this story before, but this takes that trope, dips it in acid, and then just pairs down the writing in this wonderful, delicious way. The chapters are incredibly short, and they alternate between the two main characters, Julie and James. They are embarking on a new venture in their life with a brand new home, and very quickly and very horrifyingly, their madness starts to encroach upon their life, mainly due to this house. But is it really due to this house? Hard to say. Their descent into madness is deliciously uncomfortable. I love this book so much. I tend to keep my horror fan brain and my literary fan brain in two kind of separate rooms. But this book managed to open the doors to both and let them kind of mingle in a common space. So please check out The Grip of It by Jack Jones. Jamie, what do you have for us? All right. I'm going to say also that I love Grady Hendrix. (laughs) And I have to give a shout out to Final Girl Support Group, which was my favorite. Um, And part of what I loved about that is that I could tell that he loved those movies. He was not making fun of them. I'm sure he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. (laughs) And he doesn't ever make them the butt of the joke. Um, It's clear that he actually adores these um, horror films. And um, I do too. So I really enjoyed that. I'm pretty sure uh, that one thing he would not mind me poking fun of or anybody else would be bureaucrats though. And so uh, I'm going to talk today about Daniel O'Malley. He's an Australian author, weirdly with an American accent. He spent his formative years in America. Uh, But he uh, was working for the Australian, I want to get this right, Transport Safety Bureau, writing press releases for like boating accidents and things. And he saw all this kind of high drama of these accidents combined with the bureaucracy in his office. And it inspired him to write this series of books called The Sheke Files. And um, these are pretty cool. There's a series of three books. The one I'm going to talk about today is The Rook. It's the most well-known, and um, they have actually made a television series about this. Um, These are a very high action book, like a Grady Hendrix book, tongue planted firmly in cheek. Um, I'd consider it fantasy and not horror, um, but there is some good stuff here, I think, for Grady Hendrix fans. Uh, And so the setup is um, fun. It's uh, Miffany, spelled with a W because it's Welsh. Her name is Miffany Thomas. She snaps away because she's wearing blue gloves. She doesn't know why. There's a whole bunch of dead bodies around her. 
She has no idea who she is or how she got into this situation. She reaches into her coat pocket. She finds a letter addressed to you, and it tells her, hey, you can go live a fantastic life and never get any questions answered about what happened here today if you just take this key, follow these instructions. Or alternately, you can go back to the shadowy government organization that you work for and find out who's trying to assassinate you. And so after a little bit of waffling, she decides to do that. And so she goes back to her apartment. She finds this killer binder that is so stuffed full of information because the person who occupied her body before her is highly organized. (laughs) She figures out that this organization she works for is this shadowy sort of MI5, monster hunting kind of MI5. They protect Britain from um, supernatural and unnatural forces. And everyone who works there has a superpower, too. And Miffany finds out she can control people through her touch. So she begins to suspect that might have something to do with why she was wearing gloves when she um, passed out or whatever it was that happened to her. Uh, And so lots of fun ensues. And the threats she faces are just really absurd. And I think that uh, Grady Hendrix fans would find them fun. Uh, There's a big patch of semi-sentient mold. There's a big carnivorous flesh-eating cube. Lots of nonstop fun action. The mystery at the heart of the story of trying to figure out who is trying to kill her um, really keeps the tension high and keeps the story going. And then just the sheer weirdness of her coworkers at the Sheke and all the monsters they fight. Um, I think that really combines for some good gross-out horror moments and uh, a lot of high action fun. So I think a, a Grady Hendrix fan would find a lot to love here. Excellent. Oh, yeah, great pick. The Rook is so much fun. Daniel O'Malley is... You're right, just tongue planted firmly in cheek. Really, you can tell this author is having fun. Um, And I think any reader will just have a great ride as well. So nice choice, as always. (laughs) That is all we have for today. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Uh, You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I am Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thank you so much, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.